most of you students probably realize, and as you go through life, you will realize it even more so, that most people do not accomplish much. In almost any effort that you undertake, the majority do very little. A very small minority carries the load. This is a hard and cruel fact, but it is altogether too true. The small minority, however, is that group that accomplishes, that leads, that makes America. Our speaker today, Dr. Spink, is a member of this minority. He is one of those few per persons who has accomplished much. He has attempted much, he has gained much responsibility, and he is, throughout the entire world, recognized for his accomplishments. One of the great hopes of the faculty here at Augsburg and in any college is to inculcate in you, the students, the desire to accomplish. This morning, you are going to hear a man who has accomplished. Dr. Spink is a native of Minnesota, was born in the Duluth area, graduated from Duluth Central High School. He then had his undergraduate work at Carleton College. Next, in chronological order that I was reading is probably the most interesting thing that I observed of his many accomplishments. From Carleton, he became a teacher in a college and interestingly enough, taught speech and was the assistant director of athletics. After two years of that, he was promoted on to medical school, went to Harvard and obtained his medical degree there. He spent a number of years in the Boston area, in the hospitals, rising to higher and higher responsibility. And in 1937, came to the medical school here at the University of Minnesota as an assistant professor. Only 10 years later, he had progressed to the point that he was made a full professor of medicine, which position or rank he still holds. It is the highest. Dr. Spink has been honored by membership in a great many organizations, honorary and professional. They are altogether too many to enumerate to you. He has traveled through many places in the world, associated with medical leaders far and wide, and is one of those leaders. Truly, it is a great privilege for us here at Augsburg to have this, gen this gentleman here this morning to talk to us. And interestingly enough, we also have more of the Spink family here for Mrs. Spink, their daughter Helen, and their son William are here also to be with us this morning. We now shall hear Dr. Wesley Spink talk on the subject, Challenge in Medical Research. Chairman, members of the faculty, students, Augsburg College. <clears throat> I'm very pleased to come here this morning and talk to you for several reasons. In the first place, uh, as your chairman is implicated, I have a deep and an abiding faith and respect for the liberal arts college, permeated with Christian ideals. In fact, as he's also stated, I taught for two years uh, in a liberal arts college before going on to medicine. In the second place, for a good many years, I was on the admissions committee of the University of Minnesota Medical School. And this gives us a pretty good idea about what the colleges of this state are turning out. And I think the best indication of what the faculty does and what the curriculum states they do or does is what your graduates do and your 
I won't tell you how you stand in respect to the other colleges, but you'd be very pleased to know. And third, <laughs> I've always had a deep respect for your president, whom I've known for a good many years, Dr. Bernhard Christensen. Uh, I'm sorry he's retiring, but I understand he is going to continue a very active life. And finally, I've been asked to talk on the challenge of medical research, which has occupied me for <laughs> 30 years. I've never given this talk before, probably never will. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it would probably give me a chance to review with you some of the events that have shaped my own career and may be of help to some of you. Uh, before plunging in, though, to medical research and the challenge of medical research, I'd like to speak very briefly about scientific effort today as a whole and the impact of science on our culture. Now, the 20th century has been characterized in many ways, but one thing we can be certain of, the scientist is in ascendancy. Now, whether for good or for evil, this is a fact. And there are a great many people in this world today, in our Western civilization especially, who feel that because of this impact of science and scientific technology, our culture, our heritage, is in a great danger. This has been voiced especially by individuals like Dr. C.P. Snow, one of Great Britain's great physicists and a novelist. In a lecture given, or two lectures given a few years ago at London University on two cultures and the scientific revolution, he stated in a very, very pessimistic tone that the world is being divided into anti-intellectuals and intellectuals. Now, the so-called intellectuals are the people interested in literature, art, music, who look upon the anti-intellectuals, the scientists, as being very inhuman, devoid of those things for which a liberal arts education stands for, and the dichotomy is becoming, the chasm between the two is becoming deeper and deeper. And unless something is done about it, it will lead to a catastrophe and probably a degradation of our Western civilization. Now, as I said before, there are many people who feel this way. Now, I'm not quite so pessimistic about this, and there are a great many people feel as I do, that this scientific technology, especially in our nation, in our Western civilization, has brought us to the highest standard of living any country has ever obtained, for better or for worse, and whether we abuse it, it's another matter, but this is a fact. And this result of scientific technology has spilled over to other nations so that they are taking advantage of it and will profit by it. <coughs> Your chairman has told you about my traveling. And I have had occasion to visit underprivileged countries and communistic countries. And one of the precise reasons why we are the target of communistic nations is because of this technological development. They're envious. In fact, they're almost paranoid about it. So whether we abuse it or not, this is a fact and this uh, should be recognized. I don't think we go back by any means. This has been called an age of specialization. And here again, I don't think we'll go back. In my own profession of medicine, we are accused of turning out specialists. We're losing the close personal contact of the family doctor. Here again, I can say this, that as far as the American people are concerned, Medical care is the best in the world. Whether or not we can continue as we are doing, 
specialize in giving people the care that they're getting because of the cost. That's another matter. And that, you may be sure, in the next year in the halls of Congress will be debated furiously the cost of medical care. Everybody agrees it's good. Specialization is good. But can we afford it? So I, should, I, I, I think as this debate goes on between science and science, scientific achievement and what we've accomplished in medicine, in the natural sciences, physics, electronics, agriculture, we should all bear in mind the fruits and what we can have if we don't abuse it. Now what are we going to do about it? Well, I think this college represents one very serious and major attempt to do something about it. Because what is the purpose of a liberal arts education? It's a way of life. A liberal arts education should give one a sweep of history, of art, literature, and insight into science, whether or not you appreciate the depth of it, you certainly can work with the vocabulary, not only for four years here, but for a continuing inquiry as to what's going on. And if the liberal arts college doesn't accomplish this, I don't think any other group in this country will do so. I agree so much with a statement that appeared in your newspapers here uh, within this last few weeks, a statement of your president on the small liberal arts college private in nature. I feel that they should be supported for all they're worth because this is the backbone of what I'm talking about in combating this scientific inhumanism. Well, so much for this. I, I think the university is a great place for some people, for the graduate school and its professional schools, but this is the place to prepare for it, as far as I'm concerned. Now, Having talked to you in general about science your con and your participation in some of this technological development, I'd like to discuss briefly then with you the choice of medicine and of medical research as a career. Not so much to get you and to invite you to do this, but to show you that this is what, what you can do after graduating from college in many avenues today. The opportunities are great. You know, most of us believe that we make choices on the basis of decisive and definitive thinking and after much painful education in many respects. But in reality, the decisions that we make and the choice that we arrive at are sometimes based upon very small things and above all the opportunity of the moment. There are fortuitous factors such as what individuals tell us, teachers, and what we read. And if you'll pardon me a moment, I'd like to refer briefly to some of these as far as I'm concerned. As far as reading, as far as the, truly the love of English literature. This is what I have uh, first obtained from my father. Some of you said, uh, uh, Chairman said, I was born in Duluth. That's true. But this is probably the reason the most influential person in my high school career was an English teacher. The most influential person at Cotton College was an English teacher. Although in high school I decided upon medicine as a career and was majoring in science and in Car at Carlton College organic chemistry was my choice. <laughs> it was a good course and I learned a great deal because it colored my research. But as far as the best 
and most influential teacher are concerned, it was an English professor. He doesn't know it. And this is true of much teaching. The influence of a teacher is considerable. Then the influence of reading. Now, during this Christmas holiday, I had occasion to go back and read three of the books that influenced me in college 30 years ago. One, perhaps some of you might be interested in reading them. One was Aerosmith, written by Sinclair Lewis. It's a marvelous story of a medical student, a medical intern, general practitioner, and a research worker. I don't think the plot's very good, but the, it's, it's accurate. It's a good picture of some of the hardships and the frustration. And why is it good? Because Sinclair Lewis had as his technical advisor Paul de Croyf, who himself is a real scientist who was a member of the Rockefeller Institute. He now writes for the Reader's Digest, but at that time, he, <laughs> he was a member of the Rockefeller Institute and he made very basic contributions to medicine. But it's a good yarn for anyone who would be interested in nursing or medical technology of any kind. Now, Paul de Croyf himself did a remarkable thing at about the same time. He wrote Microbe Hunters. This was quite a remarkable book because for the first time, a scientist trying to put into lay language what people were doing in medical science. This really was an influence as far as I'm concerned. And I just learned this last week how this book influenced one of the leading scientists of today, much more so. Dr. Albert Sabin, whom some of you have heard of, the Sabin polio vaccine, who was internationally famous, whose vaccine has now been given to over 50 million peoples in this world, had a very interesting career. He was born in Russia in 1908. And because of the Jewish persecution, his family came to New York City, penniless, and an uncle there said that he would take Albert under his wing and give him an education. He went through the schools of New York City, into college, and was in the school of dentistry when he read micro punters. And he said, I'm going to give up dentistry. I want to be a micro hunter. He went into medicine, and today he's research professor of pediatrics at Cincinnati and probably one of the 10 leading biologists of the world on the basis of reading uh, this one volume. I should like to very briefly then refer to another one, read when I was a senior and was the reason I went to Harvard. The Life of William Osler by Harvey, Harvey Cushing. At that time, the world's greatest brain surgeon, professor of surgery at Harvard. I went there with the idea of being a surgeon and was a student under him for two years. But you see, it's the little things, the reading, the influence of teachers that you can't appreciate at this time, but as time goes on, this accumulates and, and may I get into medical school with you? Because there again, medical research was the furthest from what I'd ever do. And I had as a professor of microbiology, Dr. Hans Zinzer, who was the most stimulating teacher I've ever had, who wrote, as I remember him, which I think along with the education of Henry Adams are the two greatest autobiographies ever written by Americans. He wrote that book when he was dying, and he knew he was dying, of a fatal disease. He also wrote Let Rats, Lice, and History, which is the history of typhus. Uh, a disease that afflicted the world during World War I. But here again, a teacher presented with enthusiasm, attracting, I don't know how many students, John Enders, at the same time a student, was the man who went on to discover how to culture poliomyelitis a virus vaccine, made possible the vaccine of Sabin. He was a student at the same time, and was a major in English literature on his way to getting a PhD in English, which is rather interesting too. 
And then I'd like to recite one, one more influence just to show you the impact of teachers at various levels, undergraduate school, high school, in college, medical school. In my senior year at Harvard Medical School, I was going to go into pediatrics from surgery. I knew I couldn't be a surgeon. <laughs> You'd have to be a technician. And uh, I just found out that I couldn't tie knots. <laughs> And Dr. Cushing told me I couldn't tie knots. But I like to think, and so I decided to go into something where you could sit beside the bedside and think. And certainly with a crying baby, it gives you time for thought. <laughs> so I decided to go into pediatrics. And I reached pediatrics in my senior year. And one day I came in to the Boston City Hospital to present the history of a sick patient to the professor of medicine, Dr. George Minot. This young boy that I was presenting had chills and fever, and he was suffering from a disease known as trichinosis, which is due to ingesting raw pork. It occurs in Minnesota, improperly cooked pork. And as I presented it to Dr. Minot, he said, you know, what you should do now is take off a little time and investigate the blood picture in this disease. It's interesting. Now, Dr. George Minot, later on, I was his assistant, discovered the use of liver for pernicious anemia and won the Nobel Prize. And so, just on the basis of that, I took three months off of my senior year and did that, then went down with Dr. Minot and his group for seven years in postgraduate medicine. And that was goodbye to pediatrics and into medical research and then the invitation to come to Minnesota in 1937. Now, I recite this background, and I do it from a personal point of view, simply because I think it's much better for me to recite something I know about than to take something from somebody else and say this is the way they did it. But this is the way a great many people do it. Very simple. These, the, the, these influences of teacher, of reading, thinking, and then the opportunity of the moment. Grab it and run with it. Now, coming to Minnesota in 1937, just 25 years ago, was the opportunity of the moment because my interest was infectious diseases, microbiology, and that was the year that the sulfa drugs came in. And so for 25 years at Minnesota, there's been the opportunity. No one else was interested to take all of these sulfur drugs, investigate them in the laboratory, in humans, with the antibiotics, and so forth. And that's what we're doing up to the present day, one phase. So it was the opportunity of the moment with the training that was necessary at a place where this opportunity had arisen. I'd like to spend the rest of the time talking to you about a disease and about some of the impact that this has had on medical research and some of the activities that has resulted not only locally but on a national level and finally internationally and end up uh, uh, discussing with you briefly then the activities of an organization like the World Health Organization. In August 1937, which will be just 25 years ago, I came upon the wards right across the river upon a sick farmer with chills and fever. He was hopelessly ill. He was only 34. And there was nothing we could do about him. <clears throat> Now, no, no doctor likes to lose a patient. He had undulant fever, brucellosis. His cows had a disease called Bang's disease, which is very common in this state. A disease whereby the organisms are transmitted in the milk, and then by drinking raw milk, 
individuals get this disease or by coming in contact with farm animals, swine and hogs that are infected. I had never seen this disease before. There's nothing we can do about it. That was all in September. I saw another young farmer, likewise with onion and fever, the infection on his heart valves, he died. Well, in within 30 days then, to see this and to realize <laughs> there was no treatment, to realize that it's probably very common in this state, because it was a dairy state and agriculture, started myself and my graduate students on a search that's lasted up into the present time. We were very fortunate, the opportunity of the moment, because at the farm school there was a very active group of scientists out there who were interested in the disease in animals because the disease affected the livestock industry. It meant economic disaster for many, many farmers, both in swine and with cattle. Then in the laboratories of the State Board of Health on our campus, there was a group of people interested in the diagnosis of this disease. So here you see the university hospital situated between two very active groups in a great university studying this disease and the way was open, the opportunity of the moment. So we became interested in several features. One, how, what was the incidence of this disease? How do you diagnose it? Above all, what could we do to prevent it and what could we do to treat it? There was no treatment available. There are over 80 diseases of animals transmissible to man and this, we found out, was the most common disease transmissible to man, not only here but the world over. So we started in and the war interrupted our inter efforts to some extent. Then we picked up again with graduate students studying very phase, various phases. And I'd like to uh, point out two results within 10 years. First, we found out how the disease is transmitted to man. That many people in this state were getting milk that was unpasteurized, becoming infected, coming down with flu-like symptoms, and then were sick week in and week out, not knowing what they had. We felt the only way we could control this was to get a law that would require the pasteurization of milk that was to be consumed by human beings. And this is when I left the ivory tower and found out about the facts of life, because a group of us went over to the state legislature and we thought that Minnesota, a great state, should have a law that prohibited the sale of raw milk to human beings where they could get typhoid, diphtheria, scarlet fever, onion and fever, and so forth, tuberculosis. And I found out how laws are passed. You don't introduce a bill on the House floor or the Senate floor, it's in committee. You have a group of committees who listen to voters. And if the voters are seem to be for it, they introduce the bill. And it seems that the voters aren't for it, well, then they don't introduce the bill. And so Dr. Gaylord Anderson, head of preventive medicine, the late Dr. William O'Brien, myself, a few others, went over there with all our scientific facts, enthusiastic. There were 75 people gathered in a small room with this committee. And I found out one thing when any bill comes up about which there's some controversy or it treads upon the economic welfare of a group of people, look out. I found out another thing that there's always this fringe, lunatic fringe group who come up and really can murder something. I got up and spoke about the public health aspects of pasteurized milk and the danger of ingesting unpasteurized milk. And there were people who popped up and told me that by pasteurizing milk, you just you you uh, ruin its nutritional qualities. And they cited this evidence and that evidence, and they went right around the circle. Well, but it was organized. That's quite obvious. But the most serious thing was a group of people who said we represent individuals with three, four cattle, 
who sell our milk without much profit, but if you were to request us to pasteurize it, it would ruin us economically. And they had petition. Well, that took care of that bill. It didn't get onto the floor. And I learned, for one thing, this is the way that most bills are introduced, and that if you're going to get any place with any kind of social legislation or well legislation for public welfare and public health, you've got to work. Well, I took my troubles to a very wise man on the fa farm campus. Some of you on the faculty may know him, Professor J.O. Christensen. He's a remarkable man. He said, Doctor, I'll tell you how to get this bill through. He said, I'm responsible for a group of farm wives who gather here every fall on this campus for one week from all over the states. They represent women's clubs and 4-H clubs, and they listen to our home economics teachers and to our professors and so forth. And what you want to do is to come over and talk to this group of ladies. There'll be four or five hundred of them. And you talk to them about the public health aspects. And so I went over there prepared with photographs of these patients, the charts, temperature, pictures of their heart, <laughs> infection, and so forth. Well, this is really a remarkable thing because all of those ladies asked very intelligent questions. They went back all over the state. They talked to their husbands. Their husbands talked to the legislatures. And when we appeared the next fall, there was nothing to it. Uh, <laughs> I didn't dare tell the legislature, the group over that, that we were only one of the five or six in the nation that had a state law for pasteurization. But as a result, this Minnesota experience of pasteurization and legalization of milk for human consumption, many, many states now have this in effect. But it just gives you some idea that as a scientist, you could stay in the laboratory and you can get all the evidence in the world and then publish this in your scientific journals and get accolades for this work. But as far as doing anything about it, you got to get out and suffer with the rest of the population. And this was a good experience because the next step was on a national level. Uh, during the war, the uh, desire to produce food was so terrific that the safeguards against animal health broke down completely. And this disease is just spreading like wildfire through the cattle countries into swine and to these areas where sheep and goats. This occurred around the world. And people were becoming very, very alarmed about it. So they desired that if you can, if you could do this sort of thing in Minnesota, what about on a national level? And so the National Research Council, I'll tell you about this because it's important in our public welfare, desired that a committee be formulated to get together the facts and make recommendations for the control of this disease. Now let me tell you a word about the National Research Council. During the presidency of Abraham Lincoln, during the Civil War, Mr. Lincoln felt that he should have an advisory group, non-governmental, non-prejudiced, which would give information to the government and for public welfare, and the National Academy of Sciences was formulated. This is the highest, most distinguished group of scientists in this country today. And when something comes up with relation to public welfare, whether it be atomic energy, nuclear fission, whether it be this problem I'm talking about, the National Research Council in Washington under the National Academy brings together the best experts they can get, formulates evidence, and gives it to the governmental organization or any other group who wants it. And this is what we did with brucellosis. Now, one of the things they said, well, you went to the state legislature. Would you go to the livestock producers of this country and tell them what's going on? Tell them the dangers. Tell them the need for controlling this disease. And this is another instance where I learned how if you anything in favor of social welfare that deals with economic affairs and effects uh, takes a fight. 
So I, with a group from the Department of Agriculture and a group of veterinarians, I appeared before groups of livestock producers all through this country telling them this story. And I have never heard such salty language expressed by livestock producers from Texas who were asking us to sacrifice their full-blooded cattle because of the possibility of this thing. And we didn't get anywhere in certain areas. But after, year after year, by pressure, by education, by working with groups, this resulted. Now this was the national level. Now I'd like to take you to an international level because this is the most exciting, as far as I'm concerned, of the whole thing and reflects what's going on at the present time. Over the years, a group in South America, Central America, and the United States and Canada have been interested in this disease because it is the number one disease transmissible to human beings from cattle because of its economic effects in the livestock industry. And so in 1948, or 46 rather, a group of people from the South America, Central America, and the United States met in Mexico to discuss this on a hemispheric basis. See, we had local, national, now hemispheric. Then in 1949 in the Argentine, then in 1950 in Washington, and in 1950, we met for a week with the leaders of the Western Hemisphere on this problem under the auspices of the Pan American Sanitary Bureau, which was the regional representative of the World Health Organization. Now let me tell you briefly about the World Health Organization because when the United Nations was formulated, there was nothing said about health and health welfare. So in 46, the World Health Organization was the health arm of the United Nations. And 80 countries came in on this, agreeing to pool their thoughts on all types of diseases and problems, including Russia, all except Red China, Bulgaria, Romania, and a few others. And at that time, an expert committee on this disease was formulated under the auspices of the World Health Organization. That was 10, 11 years ago, and today we still meet. There are a group of about 10 or 11 of us with representation from Russia, Italy, Spain, France, Great Britain, Mexico, Argentina, United States, who gather, Peru, Florence, Italy, next one will be Iraq, discussing this problem, how on an international basis we can work together and do something about it. Now, <laughs> as a result of this, one gets some idea of how tough it is to work together in this world today. I'm chairman of this committee, and I must confess, at times, with this little problem, it's really been rough. Because we have had to put out, under the auspices of the World Health Organization of the United Nations, definitive statements, this is what you should do about cattle, about sheep, about goats, this is the way you diagnose the disease, this is the way you should handle it, you should vaccinate this way, and so forth. Well, as the chairman from the United States suggesting this, the Frenchman will say, we don't do it this way in France. Well, you don't close up the meeting and go home. You talk about it for a while. Then when you get to the point when you want to write it, it's got to appear in French. And the Frenchman will say, well, that's the way you stated in English, but we've got to state it this way because the meaning has slightly changed. Now, you can imagine what this is when the atomic energy group sit down at the WHO, not WHO, but the United Nations to discuss about some things. But to my mind, this sort of effort is probably on a much larger basis is the only thing that's going to bring us through today.
to sit down in all sincerity and in a friendly way. <laughs> and I say friendly with a certain degree of cynicism because it's not easy. And discuss this problem taking hours and hours and hours away from your home and trying to come to some conclusion. Now, as a part of this, I've agreed to serve as a consultant, have went into Yugoslavia in 1951, right after the Iron Curtain was lifted. The second one to go in under WHO, Harriman was there at the advice of Truman to see what they could do about Yugoslavia citizens because they were starving. The crops had failed. The reason Tito turned just before that was because of the Berlin airlift and because his agriculture scheme was failing. There wasn't a family I visited in Yugoslavia that wasn't getting a package of food from some relative or friend in this nation. And wherever I went, incidentally, in Yugoslavia, they asked me if I knew Congressman Blatnik. His father and mother were born in Croatia, and he himself had visited there, one of their distinguished citizens. But it was quite interesting to go through there. I lost 10 pounds in two weeks. Food was terrible, disease. But this sort of an experience leaves an impression upon you about the necessity of this sort of thing. Your chairman didn't say much about it, but I've just been through the Orient. Not this time for world health, but for the Air Force in regard to certain problems. And the friendship for the United States is tremendous. The respect. And what we have done is tremendous. We made mistakes and plenty of them. But it's it's exciting, and people who say that scientists stay within their laboratories and are inhuman and don't realize what's going on just don't know what they're talking about at times. There are a few, sure, but the scientists, as well as anyone else, is interested in our preservation, and believe me, it's serious. You know it. Well, what I've tried to do in this rather informal way is to show you that one goes through life preparing, working hard. You have certain goals and ideals given to you by your family, by your teachers, incorporated through your reading, and you think you know what you're going to do, and you think you know what you can do, but there is the opportunity of the moment to do something, and you've got to run with it. <laughs> Nobody's going to tell you how to do it, or where to go, so on. Now, in, I'd like to tell you in conclusion what I say to my undergraduate students and graduate students many times. No matter what you do, whether you go into nursing, medicine, teaching, agriculture, as soon as you graduate and before if possible, take some phase of your activity and make it a part of your life. Read about it, study, travel, meet other people. And then 20 to 30 years later, this will give you more of an emotional thrill than any money can buy. It will be a sort of a fringe benefit of a liberal arts education. <laughs>
It is evident that to all of us this has been an extremely interesting talk. We thank you, Dr. Spink, so very, very much for coming here, and to your family also. It leaves me with a feeling, which probably is a feeling that you have, expressed in the words, Go thou and do likewise. The world is full of opportunities. All we have to do is want dearly enough to accomplish and work hard enough, and the results will come. There are a couple of announcements which have been requested to be made to you. First of all, the classes of Dr. Clavin will not meet this week with the exception of the fact that the course in Canadian history will meet today. Dr. Spink and his family will be in the lounge adjoining the auditorium in a moment, and those students and faculty members and friends who would like to meet and talk with him and the family are cordially invited to participate there. Convocation is dismissed. Well, that was all right. I shall read in Jesus' name two paragraphs from the thirty fourth chapter of Second Chronicles from the incident of the finding of the book of the law of the Lord in the house of the Lord in the days of Josiah. While they were bringing out the money that had been brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given through Moses. Then Hilkiah said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. Shaphan brought the book to the king and further reported to the king, All that was committed to your servants they are doing. They have emptied out the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it into the hands of the overseers and the workmen. Then Shaphan the secretary told the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book and Shaphan read it before the king. When the king heard the words of the law, he rent his clothes, and the king commanded Hilkiah, Ahikam the son of Shaphan, Abdon the son of Micah, Shaphan the secretary, and Asaiah the king's servant, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. Amen. Augsburg is not a Bible school, but it's a school built on the Bible. If it weren't for the Bible and its message, Augsburg College and Seminary certainly wouldn't be here. Now this incident from the 2,500 years ago or so, a little more than that I suppose, from the days of King Josiah when they set about to uh, uh, repair the temple and uh, get some of the old ways going, and in the course of it, found this book of the law of the Lord, which apparently had been neglected for a long, long time, dusted it off and began to read it and reported to the king about it. And then you had all this stir, of which I read just a few few sentences here. This is, uh, is a rather uh, typical sort of thing that has taken place many times in the history of the Bible. Of course, this was a part of the Old Testament. It wasn't even the whole Old Testament. But here it was found, and the king becomes disturbed, and, and there are movements set in motion that are very far-reaching in the life of Israel. 
the rediscovery of the book of God. And you begin to read it and you see that here are some things that, that we haven't been paying attention to. And then there are, say, some far-reaching results. Now, one of the happy things about our particular day, your particular day as a student, is that this is another time, shall we say, of the rediscovery of the book of the law of the Lord. Now, not only part of the Old Testament, not only the whole Old Testament, but the Old Testament and the New. We are living, you are studying in a time when uh, in the midst of a lot of other movements, like scientific movements, for instance, that Dr. Spink talked with us about yesterday and many other movements that this is certainly also a time of a rediscovery of the, of the book of God, of the Bible. And I like to mention just very briefly this morning three uh, important phases of this or three important aspects of this uh, of this wonderful uh, rediscovery of the scriptures, which happens to come, at least in part, in your student days. Now, the first one is this, that in our time in America, I'm talking now particularly about our country, America, because these movements are a little different in different countries, that in our time there has been a, a rediscovery of the Bible as a address to man's needs as a sinner, the religious needs of man, the Bible as the word of God to man as a sinner. Now, I never forget, and I may have mentioned in chapel, maybe recently even, because I don't remember now from one time to the other, this man that I met during my student days, uh, he told me he was going up to Yale, and I said, are you going to do some work with Dean Brown, who happened to be the dean up there? Then, oh, no, he says, I'm through with that long ago. I'm going to study economics so that I can learn to apply the principles of Jesus. I've never forgotten that because it was so characteristic of my day as a student. He was through with this old business about the the gospel and uh, this sort of thing. He was going to study economics so he could apply the principles of Jesus. Now, if any of you heard uh, Dr. Niebuhr over at Luther Seminary the other night, uh, he told about that age, of which he too was a part, when everybody was interested in applying the principles, as it were, of Christ so that You'd remake the world and remake society and uh, build the kingdom of God on earth and so on. Well, in our time, uh, really nobody, very few at least, there may be a few far left-wing people who are talking that way, but by and large, we have come to see that the message of the Bible is essentially a message to man as a sinner. Man can't build this I ideal society by his own strength. And of course we've seen man as a sinner. We've lived through the age of Hitler. Hitler. Time and again during those years I wanted to pinch myself and say, can it actually be that people are being murdered? Jewish people and other people by the millions. I, you just couldn't believe that you were living in this time. Well, we know that we were living through it. And we have had such a revelation of human sin that, that in my childhood or in my youth as a student, we just could not have imagined. And the Bible, as having a message to man as a sinner, has been rediscovered. Now there's another phase of human life that had been too largely lost sight of in the optimistic and individualistic age of past generation. And that is man as a corporate being. 
the age of the Enlightenment and uh, Aufklärung in Germany, as they talked about it, and uh, and the earlier, shall we say, the end of the last century and the beginning of the 20th century in our own country, there's so much emphasis upon individual rights. Now, this is a good emphasis, and it's an important emphasis, and it belongs in democracy. But even within the church, there was not a sufficient recognition of the fact that we are also corporate beings. You can't break away from your family. You say, I don't, I'm tired of my parents. I want to get away from them. You can't get away from them. You take it right with you in your blood. You can go to the South Pole if you want to. You're still part of that Olson family or Christensen family or whatever it is. And you're, you're still a Norwegian American, a lot of you. Or Irish American, some of you maybe. You can't get away from it. We're part of society the corporate aspects of human life. And now this is being emphasized, uh, has been, shall I say, re-emphasized in our time. Communism is the most extreme example of it. Many evil things about communism, but one of the good sides is that it, is, it has renewed a recognition of the corporate side of man's life. And this has come so much to the fore that even in one of the recent, uh, in one of the recent encyclicals, I guess you call it, of the Pope, he calls attention to the fact that we mustn't think that it's all de-Christianization if there's a certain amount of socialization in life. You take these countries where you have the welfare state, as for instance in England, uh, they have many aspects of the welfare state there which we don't have in our country. And if you talk with some of these uh, British people, they will tell you, well, it's necessary in our, in our time for us to provide in this way. We, we are members of one another. We have some responsibility for one another's sickness and uh, how we're going to take care of people in hospitals and all of this. And you take even our modern labor movement. Well, you can't convince very many of the laboring people that you should be an individualist. You shouldn't tie up with these organizations. They will say that, well, a large part of the fact that we are living as well as we are do doing today is because we've been a part of a corporate organization. Now, I don't have time to discuss this anymore, and I can't discuss it as well as some of your teachers can. But the Bible is not only an individual book, but it's a corporate book. In fact, the whole Old Testament has a strong emphasis upon the corporate aspects of man's life. And there's a renewed understanding of this today. And we're not left with a superficial individualism. We have a message for man in the 20th century coming out of the darkness of Africa or Indonesia or whatever it may be or seeking to find new ways of life in this time when there are getting to be so many people on earth that they cannot live together unless they learn to live together. Well, this is a second phase of the rediscovery of the meaning of the Bible in our time. Now, there's a third one. I just barely have time to mention it. Maybe I hardly have time to mention it. As a result of the renewed study of the Scriptures, shall we say, in all branches of the Christian church. It is becoming a new avenue of approach for these churches to one another. As the, as the Protestant church has taken a more realistic view of the Bible as the word of God and has gotten away from some of the of the false liberalisms of the day when I was at where you are now. Now, we haven't altogether gotten away from it, but we've been moving away from it. And there's a new respect for the Bible, for the scriptures. And as the Catholic Church is pushed back, partly by virtue and by through the influence of Protestantism, I would say, back to the scriptures, these two great groups of Christendom will, will find a way of, uh, of meeting one another. 
I was in a meeting some months ago where one of the leaders said, one of the Catholic leaders said that we probably will soon get to the place where we can have a common Bible. Because you see, we work together at the manuscripts and we say that this is what should be there. Now, of course, we're a long way from, from uh, even the different groups of Protestantism really understanding each other. But uh, as the liberals in Protestantism pay more attention to the Bible and not simply to their own ideas about applying the principles of Jesus, well, then they've got a better basis, you see, to talk with the fundamentalists who have, who have loved the Bible always, though they may have attributed something to it that they shouldn't attribute to it. And there will be a new basis for, for talking with even the Christians of Russia, as we read about now in connection with, with New Delhi, so that a new understanding and appreciation of the Bible becomes the pathway to Christian understanding. We used to have a teacher here whose name was Dr. Ermish. The faculty remembers him. A few students perhaps don't. He always used to say, the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible. Now you can say that superficially, and you can have it meaning. You can have it uh, in, in, in a wrong way. But taken a right, I would say that this is the answer to man's need in an age that produced Hitler, to man's need in an age when he is seeing again anew his corporate character, and to a time when the different Christians are really willing to listen a little to each other. Because, as is said in one of our wonderful old hymns about the Bible, a glory gilds the sacred page, majestic like the sun. It gives its light to every age. It gives but borrows none. Let us pray. O oh, Heavenly Father, we thank thee that the students in the Christian colleges of our generation live in a time of great new opportunity, great new light on the scriptures, great new devotion to the scriptures. And as we study science and history and all the other phases of the wonderful world which thou hast made, help us to enter into this riches of thy rediscovered book for our time, and out of the Augsburg student body of today, raise up scholars and teachers who shall have a part in carrying this wonderful movement further. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us stand and sing the first stanza of hymn number 253. This morning we have on our campus Reverend Conrad Broughton, who is associated with the World Brotherhood Exchange. He has been on our campus once before and uh, he is just recently back from India, and we're pleased that he can be with us today as well. He will be available after this morning's chapel for, interest, uh, for talking with interested students in the lounge here at Simelby Hall.
Before he brings us the meditation, we will sing hymn number 181, the first four stanzas. Our gracious Heavenly Father, this morning we thank thee again that we can gather around thy holy word. We thank thee that we know that thou art present here and now and forevermore. We thank thee that thou art the source of strength for any eventuality. We thank thee for the day of opportunity. Give us a sense of responsibility and courage to realize that we are expendable for thee. In the strong name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. I want to thank the authorities here for the opportunity to address this august body again and to share with you a few things which have developed in the World Brotherhood Exchange since I was here uh, last fall. I would like to just read a few words from scriptures which I feel I feel are very relevant in this day, especially in the light of events that are taking place across the world. As pertains to things that may come, and the courage that is required, will be required of Christians in the future. It comes from Christ's words recorded in St. Matthew, the 10th chapter, beginning with the 28th verse, and I'm going to skip some, but to just give you a few verses. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake shall find it. These are very relevant words. I don't, I'm not the only one who is saying this today. I was astounded that the World Council of Churches and also words from missionaries in Ethiopia, other places in Africa, Asia, that somehow or other the sign seemed to be that we Christians are in an area, era, coming into an era when it is going to be very difficult to carry on because of the great forces that seem to have risen and are of such magnitude as to seem to be overwhelming these forces in all facets of life, in the political, in the economic, in the social, and in the religious. And you can see that very clearly as one goes into those areas of Asia and Africa, but it is even very saddening to come back after having been away for a while and then see more clearly the seeming apathy and the careless attitude that seems to prevail as far as the cross and the words of Jesus Christ and the gospel is concerned here in America. I just merely want to bring this to your attention because I feel that never before if we've studied history, has the Christian church ever been challenged with such dire consequences as it exists as it exists, exists today? And the seeming wheels of God's judgment are grinding slowly on the Western nations, the so-called Christian nations who have had the opportunity through the centuries 
And we see that as we look at television, read r the newspapers and magazines, or hear the radios. So much for that. I just hope that somehow we are beginning to become conscious of our, our day of opportunity, the tremendous sense of responsibility for those who profess the name of Jesus Christ, but all in the realization that all power, as Christ says, is given unto me, and that though he confines himself to us individuals through as he works through our hands and feet and mouths and bodies, he has confined himself to that within it, but he gives power and strength to carry out his work, and all power is in him, and greater power than the powers of Satan which seems seem to prevail in all of these facets of society. As I mentioned last time, the World Brotherhood Exchange created by a group of lay personnel and pastors from various synods in order to assist the world mission program of our Lutheran churches abroad to send Christian lay personnel to be an arm of the missionary assistance or arm of the church by assisting the missionaries in their tremendous task that they have and that confronts them overseas. And we're very thankful that the Lord has blessed this immeasurably. We have a total of 24 physicians and surgeons who are willing to go out at their own expense for a period of time, 18 dentists. We have established two dental clinics, one in Madagascar and one in Nepal, in Kathmandu. This was started by Dr. Dorrance Anderson in both cases. He's going out every summer to do this and goes out at his own expense and sets up a clinic and works for three months. I told you about Madagascar one last time. I will just briefly mention the one in Kathmandu where I was there last month. I arrived on a Wednesday and on Thursday Dr. Shop, who, who arrived when Dr. Anderson left, Dr. Shop is a dentist from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, left his five children and wife over the holidays a mortgaged home and a mortgage clinic, but feeling that this is where the Lord wanted him. And when we had, uh, even though we had made plans for him to meet the king's dentist, who is the only dentist in all of that country of Nepal, which sits between Tibet and India, that in this land of nine million people, there's only one dentist, the king's dentist, and he takes care of only the court. But as we arrived, as uh, we met Dr. Shop, we took him to the hospital area on Thursday, and the appointments to meet the King Den King's dentist and other functionaries downtown for Friday morning were established. Friday morning came, and after breakfast at 7 o'clock, we were about to go into the car to go down to the Kathmandu from the United Mission Hospital. And as we were about to do so, the nurse came crying, running out and saying to Dr. Shop, by the way, Dr. Shop, you see all those people down there? Those are all your patients. There were 80 people there who had heard that he had come in the day before and were lined up in two queues up to each dental clinic, uh, each dental chair. And so he looked at some of them and turned to me and he said, do you suppose we could dispense with the appointments downtown so I could get to work here? 7.30 in the morning he was going to work already cutting into the gums to relieve the pus and the pain that they have. These are things that are going on, and I've mentioned this just from the standpoint of the need and also from the standpoint of the men who are willing to give of themselves and sacrifice in this way to do something. And it's made a tremendous impact in that land, as the ambassador of the United States told me. Well, I could go on, but my time is short. Nevertheless, within our program of enlisting Christian laymen and women, we have also nurses going out, builders already are going for two years at their own expense down in Madagascar, going to Ethiopia in, in February. We have engineers going and uh, agriculturalists. 
If you know of any who may want to do so, please write us at World Brotherhood Exchange Headquarters in Thousand Oaks, California, which is located in the campus of the Lutheran, California Lutheran College. But I'm interested right now in just bringing across briefly for about three minutes the student program of the World Brotherhood Exchange, which I believe I mentioned last time I was here. It is the recruiting or enlisting of Christian students from our colleges who can afford to do so, makes their own arrangements to do so financially, who do qualify to go out as members of a Christian cell to be planted in universities in India and also at Addis Ababa University. I was very happy with the turn of events. Back in November in Ethiopia, the, min the chancellor of the university, some of the professors who are American professors there, and the missionaries pleaded for a cell to be put in that university. Ethiopia is a so-called Christian nation, Coptic, but Islam is making tremendous headway, is growing faster than Christianity is in that Christian nation, the only one in Africa. It is sort of the hub of the republics of Africa. They look to it for guidance in sovereignty. And so there is a tremendous opportunity there. There is a strong little small core of Christians in that university. And they were thrilled with the, uh, the, the thought that American Christian students would be there with them. Now, we hope to send a group this fall or this summer to Addis Ababa University of 12 to 15 students. And there they will be a semester, and then following that, go to a work camp of the American Lutheran Church about 200 miles from Addis Ababa to a place called Wuchale, where we've started an experimental center in agriculture, in engineering, and dairy farming, and so on. And it is there, the purpose of that is to assist, have the students assist in breaking the traditional ice that exists in most of Africa, and particularly in Ethiopia, where when a person has started to read and write or becomes a student, he, 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 he never touches the ground with his hands or does any kind of manual labor or works in the soil. So the object is then to, that uh, you as students then will become instruments in, in by working at it to reveal to the students that this is something honorable also and that we can work with our hands. In other words, we will be having Ethiopian students coming along with these students to this work camp and in an effort to break the ice. The Minister of Economics, a Christian man, hoped that this would be the answer in Ethiopia. This means would be the answer, as well as did the Chancellor of the University and the missionaries. And then we opened up and made um, possible through facilities that are there uh, to have a group of seven men, seven students, college students, a cell at Tirupati University in Tirupati, South India, near Madras, India. There we have a mission field. A Miss Kettner, a wonderful woman, is in charge of student work in South India. And she lives about three blocks from the campus of Tirupati University. And in this city, by the way, a rather smaller city, a city of about 18,000, uh, there are two other colleges besides the University of Terapati. So there's a field that's tremendous in one sense. But we, they, they'd like to have seven male students. And we have arranged for a home, a missionary's home that is vacant for the students to live in, which is only about two and a half, three blocks from this campus. There's also a Christian hospice of 60 Christian students, which would... Uh, which are thrilled with the idea of these fellows coming to Terapati University. This is all we're going to uh, start with this coming year, and we hope that we can expand to further cells. Uh, but any one student here, or any students who are interested 
in this program. Uh, we are certainly very happy to talk with you and to give you the details in connection with such a trip. It would be a round-the-world trip to see also four different mission fields, both in Africa and Asia, through the Holy Land, through Europe, as well as through Asia and Africa. And uh, we know that it will be a tremendous experience. You will receive much knowledge from this and uh, also be of tremendous value to the kingdom through this program. I want to thank you for this opportunity. May God bless you all. Time will lead us in our meditation. The text which I have chosen for this morning's meditation is the Gospel of John, chapter 2, beginning at the first verse. On the third day there was a marriage at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the marriage with his disciples. When the wine failed, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, O woman, what have you to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now six stone jars were standing there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. And Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the steward of the feast. So they took it. When the steward of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, Though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when men have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. In the Lutheran church, as well as in some other churches, we have a phenomenon which we call the church year. The church year begins in Advent, usually about the first part of December, and leads into Christmas, the birth of Christ. The church year then traces the life of Christ until it culminates in his death and resurrection, our Good Friday and Easter. Then later comes Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, followed by the life in the Christian church leading up to the final coming of Christ just before Advent, when the church year starts all over again. Now, if we just consider the period from Christmas to Easter, we find in the church year that the entire life of Christ is compressed into a period of about three and a half months. During this period of time, we are to concentrate our attention on the historical life of Christ and its meaning for us today. This inclusion of the life of Christ in the church year has the express purpose of showing that his life lived then has significance for our lives lived now. The church asserts that the Jesus who lived then is the Christ who is now present in the life of the church. In our text today, in the church year, we find Jesus at the beginning of his ministry. We find him enacting his first miracle, the changing of the water into wine. Now you might ask, how can such an act of Jesus in the dim past have significance for our lives in the here and now? This might be explained as follows. The church is the body of Christ. This means essentially that Christ is present and active in the life of the church today. Now, Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Christ and the way he acts do not change. This means that the way that he acted in the past is the way that he is also going to act in the present. If we look at the Gospels of the New Testament, as to how he acted in the past while he was here on earth, 
we can then discern how he is going to act now in the life of the church, for Christ does not change. But obviously, now, now in our text in the past, in the life of Christ, he changed the water into wine. Christ does not change, we assert. So this means that he is acting in the same way in the church today. But obviously, his acts in the church today do not consist in his running around changing water into wine, nor, as some would wish, changing wine into water. This compels us, I think, to look a little closer at the text to discern its central meaning. John calls the miracle that Jesus performed a sign. Now, what does he mean by the word sign? By strict definition, a sign is a normal or abnormal phenomenon which is an indication of things to come or of things which are. To put this definition into the text would mean that the miracle that Jesus performed was and is a sign of his real work. For example, maybe if some, if some of you have been to Los Angeles, as you cruise down the freeway, you could hardly help but noticing some large billboards like Disneyland or Knott's Berry Farm. Now these signs proceed to tell you what will be found if you turn at a certain corner. Now what are these billboards? They are signs of things which are, or of things which are to come. You don't see Disneyland just by looking at the sign, but you get an indication of what it is like by reading the description on the sign. Again, you can't tell your friends that you were at Knott's Berry Farm if all you did was get out of your car, stop, and look at the sign. But the sign was what pointed you to the real thing. And so this miracle in our text is a sign which points us to the real thing. That is to say, there is a much deeper meaning behind the physical aspects of the miracle story, that is the changing of the water into wine. The physical miracle used by John is a sign of Christ's power to work a greater spiritual miracle. The real message of this miracle story, in fact, the real miracle, is not the physical act which we find on the surface in our text. But this physical act, this physical miracle, serves the purpose of pointing to the real miracle, the real action of God on behalf of men. Again, using our illustration, the sign on the freeway is like the physical act in our text. They both point to the real thing, the deeper reality. But what is this deeper reality, this spiritual miracle, this real action of God to which the text points? It is this. The drastic change that took place when the water was changed into wine is a picture of the drastic change that comes over our lives when we are transformed from an unchristian to a Christian sphere of existence. Now the water in Palestine is lousy, literally. It is stagnant and polluted. It's not fit to drink. Jesus then transformed something that was commonplace, valueless and polluted into something that was of great value, wine. And in the Bible, this is seen as a sign of life. This physical act, then, serves the purpose of pointing to the real action of God in the life of men. 
the transformation of man from a commonplace, purposeless existence to the life with God. Water is to wine what one's former existence is to his Christian life and existence. There is no comparison. The latter is so much greater than the former. The former is dwarfed into meaninglessness and nothingness when the latter comes into being. We can now see how this act of Christ in the past becomes significant for the present. In the past, God's action in the purpose of Christ transformed those who believed into a completely new creation. Now, Christ does not change. He acts in the same way in the church today. And so, if we today will admit that we need his help, Christ will act now. He will enter into our lack of purpose lives and transform them into something that is characterized by meaning and by purpose. As water compares to wine, so is any other kind of life compared to the fullness that is given by Christ in the new life that he can create within us. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new is come. In Christ, one's life is a transformed life. But perhaps this transformed life needs to be characterized a bit further. Our text rebukes the foolish fear that religion robs life of its happiness or that loyalty to Christ is somehow inconsistent with exuberant spirits and innocent pleasure. It corrects the false impression that sourness is a sign of sainthood or that gloom is a condition of godliness. Christ came that we might have life and that we might have it abundantly. But this new life is not something that is to be kept for oneself alone. It is to be shared. It has often been stated that we are so dull and unexcited in our Christian faith that when others look at us, they see nothing to it, and they turn away. The only way in which we can share this life with others is by showing all with whom we come into contact that our lives have been transformed, by convincing those outside that we have something of infinite value that they do not have. Our text points up two possible contexts in which this can be done. First, in our everyday tasks. One notices that the only ones who knew that Jesus had changed the water into wine were slaves. Christ here has slaves as his fellow workers. Today he acts in the same way. He does not keep to himself the task of saving the world, but he wants to share this responsibility with those of us who will accept the task. There is an odd notion around today that one cannot serve Christ in the factory or the office or the classroom. But we have seen that in the New Testament, one can do it as a slave. And indeed, most of us can work for him in the main by the honesty, the thoughtfulness, and the cheerfulness with which we carry out our daily tasks. Secondly, in our home life, or could we say dorm life, I'm sure the people in our text wanted Jesus to be with them in their home. They had no fear that he would make some feel uncomfortable. And I'm sure that there was no awkward silence at the end of the table at which he sat. Your Christianity and mine should make us thoughtful and unselfish in the living out of the little things that go to make up our days. In conclusion then, when Christ comes today into a life, 
He transforms it by his very presence. He redirects the characters and the capacities of those to whom he comes. He brings with him and offers to anyone who truly wants it a life that is an abundant life, a peace that passes all understanding, and a fullness of joy that only he can give. We will sing stanzas one, three, and four of hymn number 530. After which, Mr. Rick's Maybe <clears throat> You'll excuse me this morning if I read what I have to say. I'm uh, verbose enough that if I don't read this word for word, I'll never finish on time. <clears throat> I still may not finish on time. <clears throat> With respect to the opportunities confronting us today, many say that we were born in an age of golden opportunity, and this seems to be true. With respect to Christianity, however, it seems that your birth and mine was very poorly timed. Unlike the early Christians, whose only great defeat was turned into a great triumph, whose early history was so triumphant that even their enemies remarked that they were turning the world upside down. Unlike them, we have a heritage so overburdened with defeat and failure of every sort that we blush to recall it. When we want to point to some period in the history of the church, we most clearly convey the period if we refer to the prevailing heresy, the dominant squabble, the religious wars, or the splits in the church that occurred at the time. Unlike the Christians in times of persecution, who knew quite well what their Christian faith would demand of them, who at times couldn't so much as clear their throat in the name of Christ lest they get their throat slit, unlike these, we today are completely baffled, or almost so, as to what we can do that is really Christian. We pride ourselves on our generous giving until we perhaps read of some agnostic who in one generous flourish tops the entire budget of the LFC with a donation to some home for cripples. Being so easily done, outdone in such practical matters by the world, having failed to gain recognition and new followers to Christianity, we turn perhaps to scathing pronouncements, hoping to shock people out of their lethargy. We are merciless with them as we enunciate what a far cry we are from what Christians really ought to be. Then when the applause has died down, we meekly and quite defeated receive the hearty handshakes and the assurances that such nice preaching is certainly appreciated by all. By hook or by crook, however, some of us manage to get persecuted at least a little bit. But common sense usually reminds us quickly that it all could have been avoided if we had only changed our socks or instead of our bullheaded dogmatism, we had used a little elementary tact. Quite unable to convince ourselves that any worth has come to Christianity by our efforts, we save ourselves from despair by turning to the old, reliable, and always there doctrinal arguments. Some of us manage to avoid the preaching and the search for persecution and jump right into the fray. Now, whether you begin early or late, when you are solidly entrenched in some position with regard to these doctrinal issues, and I can't think of anything easier than becoming so entrenched, then your investigation has pretty well come to an end. Not that your question, how can I act and live like a Christian, has been answered. Quite the contrary. You've forgotten the question. It's rather that the nature of these arguments is such as to offer you enough materials to keep you hot and bothered for longer than any of us hope to live. Such arguing will only cease on the day that evil will be gone, and the cause of human suffering won't lead inevitably to God. Such discussion will cease on that day when everyone is convinced of the other utter reliability 
or unreliability of the Bible. On the day that the church mergers will be found to be to completely eliminate evil. I am assured that if you want to spend your life engaged in such controversy, you will have engaged in the easiest, most natural enterprise known to man, namely pointing out existing evils in men, in churches, in doctrines. I am not saying that such questions ought not to be raised, but I am saying that such procedure will in no way, shape, or form offer to us an answer to our question. How can I act? How can I live? How can I be a Christian at Augsburg today? This morning, I would like to answer this question once and for all. <clears throat> it is indeed most unfortunate that I cannot. But um, <laughs> some of you know me well enough to know that I wouldn't give it up without giving it a try in any case. <clears throat> I would suggest two ideas that I think hinder us from living meaningful Christian lives today and tomorrow. Both ideas are able, are capable of aiding us, but too often their effect is to stifle what little hope and desire there really exists within us. Firstly, the idea that we ought to behold before our eyes that we ought to aspire to lives that measure up to that of the early Christians. No one can help but be impressed by these transformed men. As ignorant as they were, their effect upon the world was astounding. Who, who I say would dare suggest that such notable examples of Christian commitment ought not to be our constant goal? I would so suggest. And further, I would suspect that the devil and all his cohorts pull out their best spirits when some weak Christian sets up just such a goal for himself. They know better than we that failure is almost inevitable. But you say, didn't Christ demand complete commitment? Indeed he did. But he did not demand a full realization of what was involved in that commitment. When he called the fishermen by the sea, they responded by leaving all. But as far as their knowing what to do, I doubt you could have hardly found more ignorant clods in all the world. The next three years to be, were to be grueling years, years of doubt, frustration, wonder, full of first-class goofs and first-rate disappointments. Disappointment in this Jesus. He seemed to be so slow, seemed to have no concrete aspirations. Right up to the third crow of the cock and on to the doubting and despairing session following Christ's death, these namby-pambies were a disgrace to beat disgraces. What does this mean for you? <clears throat> It means that you will have at least to hold the same role, perhaps a tougher role. The Christianity that we proclaim today is such a worn out, smelly old rag that people won't even persecute you. They just ignore you. They've heard so much crummy preaching that doesn't even measure up to the quality of a cheap paperback that just the word preach has taken on the character of a swear word. Don't look for any glorious path of Christian commitment in this day. If you do, disappointment and disillusionment will fall upon you like a mountain. But, having acknowledged the difficulty, don't fear it. It is only by tangling with such situations, such difficulties, that you will grow. Christians, when they correctly understand their task and fully appreciate the power that is at their disposal, are the best equipped people in the world to face realistically the most perplexing problems that confront themselves personally, as well as those that confront society. Perhaps you've heard of the farmer who bellered so loud against the way God treated his crops that God let him try it for a year. He loved rain and sunshine and hated wind. Couldn't see any sense in it at all. What a surprise at harvest to find upon his stalks wheat and corn so anemic that it had to be thrown away. The occasional battering of the wind was all important. Adversity, trouble, discouragement are all absolutely necessary for you and for me. Value these times of discouragement highly. God can work his great work in us when we sense most intensely our need for him and cling tenaciously to his promise and the reality of his faithfulness. Since we tend to feel so self-sufficient when things are normal and happy, these difficult times 
If we can detect or at least trust in God's purpose, greater purpose for us, these times can provide for us our greatest possibility for Christian growth. Some people get angry at God when things go wrong. They miss the truth that adversity can be an open door to the God whom we usually consider unnecessary. A psalm put to music, the choir sang it last year, speaks to this great truth. It goes something like this. And going through a veil of misery, use it for a well, and the well is filled with cool water. In this valley of despair, be alert. God is there. And if you search, you will find him. Then will this valley, actual valley of despair, become a well. And the well will be filled with cool waters. Mind you, the veil won't disappear. The solution won't necessarily be found. The loved one lost won't be returned. But God will be there. You will meet him, and he will meet you there with his grace. Don't fear these times. Welcome them. Use them. The second idea that might well hinder us is this, that the primary encouragement for life today is the hope we have of eternal life, of heaven, the primary hope. That we can look beyond the present frustration and seeming hopelessness to our promised eternal life. This attitude automatically excludes one from seeing the present struggles as I have just outlined them. When I was a boy, when I was a young boy, <clears throat> I can recall the promise of my father that we would go the following summer to Grandpa's farm. This future hope was so delightful to my ears that I thought no discouragement could dim it. Then I heard the good word, mow the lawn, wash the dishes. I give him the old negative. I told myself that I could endure any punishment that might be incurred by such a negative response so long as I could recall to mind the coming pleasures of a summer on the farm. No situation since has brought home to me what hell really must be like. God graciously has enabled us to receive each day's encouragement from that day as we respond to him in obedience. Allow me to suggest what this obedience demands of us. Firstly, it does not demand results. It demands faithfulness. You need not and you ought not to measure the worth or the fruitfulness of your life by any standard or by any other man. Even if in your efforts to obey, you should hurt his cause, God counts it gain. The ledgers of heaven are marked not by results, be they positive or negative, but by one's faithfulness to his daily call to obedience. It was the faithfulness of the widow that caused Jesus to remark, She hath given more than all the rest, though she had only given a pence. Secondly, direct your efforts to obey toward those whom you like or dislike the most. It is not enough to simply put up with them. Christ said, What thank have ye if ye love those who love you? And again he said, if you say you love God and hate your brother, you are a liar. I would warn you, don't steer your attempt to obey down any other easier channels. You'll be wasting your time. Make his bed, pick up her clothes, and don't get disappointed if you don't get this glowing feeling inside. God honors those first efforts, even if they only be a, a suppression of hate, if it is done for his sake. Remind yourself again as you make his bed a second and third time that the Son of God, your Lord Jesus Christ, who poured out his love unto death for you, has chosen you to be his channel of love to your friend. Did I say friend? I said friend. Don't go sticking God in a box. He simply doesn't fit. and pray. Grant us the grace, Heavenly Father, to, recog to recognize our limitations 
and to appropriate thy grace and power. Through Jesus Christ, who praying taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Now may the God of peace, who was able to keep us from falling, keep us blameless in and through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This morning, Miss Joel will give the chapel presentation. We stand at the beginning of a new year, which is only 12 days old. But we are also near the end of a semester with only 12 days remaining. Life is filled with a series of beginnings and endings in the things we do, the people we meet, the time we have. As we face beginnings, we do so, so sometimes with fear and anxiety, but more often with hope and a certain amount of anticipation and usually high aspirations. We seem to hear less about New Year's resolutions today than we did a few years ago, but most people in looking to the future resolve that they will do better than they did in the past. As we face endings, whether it be the end of a semester, the end of a day or a year or of life itself, our thoughts go backward. Very few of us are proud of our successes. We regret our failures and say, if only I had it to do over again, I would do it differently. I would work harder. I would be stronger, wiser, more patient, more loving. With endings come evaluations or judgments. Sometimes they are formal, sometimes informal or unplanned. Frequently the evaluations of the success or failure of our efforts are made by other people, but more often by ourselves. But the evaluation of all our efforts on earth is made by God. And how different is his examination of our life from that which we make ourselves or which is made, say, by a teacher at the end of a semester? In the first place, God's standards are absolute, not relative. In the second place, his judgment is infallible. At the end of a semester, final examinations attempt to measure a student's achievement in the course in relation to that of his fellow students. The curve is often used. At one time, educators attempted to set up an absolute standard, and a score of 75 meant that the student got 75% of the answers correct. 50% meant he answered half of the answers correctly. Now when a student receives a score of 50, it is more apt to mean that half the students did better than he did and half did less well than he. Some people use this relative standard in evaluating their moral life. Even though they may be convinced from scripture that a certain practice is sinful, they will try to convince themselves that it's all right because everyone is doing it. I wonder if this was not the kind of reasoning <clears throat> that went on at the time of the TV rigging and the gifts of mink coats and freezers and the football scandals and perhaps is still used by some college students with regard to cheating on examinations or copying term papers. It reminds one a little of the little girl 
who cried and cried when she learned that the neighbor children were moving away. When her mother expressed surprise at her grief, since she had not realized that her daughter was so fond of them, the little girl said, it isn't that, but now there won't be anyone worse than I am. In referring to the evaluation of a semester's course, a student will sometimes say, it was not a fair examination, I should have had A in the course, or he might admit, I did not really earn that A, the examination was too easy, or the teacher might say, uh, I should have given that student an F in the course, but he put forth so much effort I did not have the heart to fail him. Or he might report, that student may, have, may not have as much ability as some others, but he put forth a great deal of effort and earned the A he got. He achieved through hard work. Most of us will agree, or at least hope, that a student's achievement in a course is in relation to the amount of well-directed effort which he has put into it. This kind of reasoning is often applied also to man's spiritual struggle. An individual may think that the more effort he puts into achieving the absolute standards of God, the more likely he will be to achieve them, or at least, he may reason, he will be rewarded for his efforts in trying to live according to God's law. Failure in the classroom can usually be remedied by starting anew with increased time and effort and improved study habits. Failure in living the godly life can be remedied also by starting anew, but it takes more than increased time and effort. First, there must be awareness of the failure. Secondly, the will to overcome it. And thirdly, the acknowledgement of the inability to overcome that failure by oneself. In the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, the man or woman addict addicted to alcohol must first realize that he or she is an alcoholic. He must want to change, and then he must admit that he cannot by himself keep from drinking, that he needs help. Similarly, in turning to God, a man must first admit that he is a sinner. He must want to become righteous, and then he must realize that he cannot by his own efforts save himself. He can only accept with thanks the gift of grace which God gives through Christ. But this then would seem to imply that success in college or in any earthly endeavor is in direct proportion to the time and effort which one puts into it, while in matters of the spirit there is nothing which one can do but accept through faith the already finished plan of salvation in Jesus Christ. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book The Cost of Discipleship speaks of cheap grace, which he defines as the deadly enemy of our church. Cheap grace, he says, means the justification of sin without the justification of the sinner. It is assent to the idea that since grace alone does everything, therefore everything can remain as it was before. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. It is the preaching of forgiveness without, without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without contrition. Bonhoeffer speaks of costly grace as the treasure hidden in the field and as the pearl of great price. It is something that a man will sell all that he has to buy. It is costly because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It costs a man his life, but it also gives a man the true life. Salvation comes by faith in Jesus Christ, but faith or belief in Christ means more than believing that he exists. It means belief in his way of life. And one who believes in his way of life must be a follower of his. Even the communists believe that President Kennedy exists, but they do not believe in what he stands for, his program. Those who believe in Jesus' program, his way of life, will give all that they have to promote that way of life, to do his bidding. That is, they will be his disciples. It is not an easy life. It is one of complete surrender to him, as Jesus says in Mark 8. Anyone who wishes to be a follower of mine must leave self behind. 
He must take up his cross and come with me. Whoever cares for his own safety is lost. But if a man will let himself be lost for my sake and for the gospel, that man is safe. What does a man gain by winning the whole world at the cost of his true self? What can he give to buy that self back? If anyone is ashamed of me and mine in this wicked and godless age, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father and of the holy angels. When Jesus called the tax collector and the fishermen to follow him, they did so without hesitation. Many whom he called, including the rich young ruler, were not willing to give up everything to be his disciple. One would-be follower said, I will follow you, sir, but let me first say goodbye to my people at home. To him Jesus said, No one who sets his hand to the plow and then keeps looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. As you begin a new semester and this new year and as you face all of life before you, I challenge you to think not only of the evaluations at the end of the semester or the year or of life, but think of the purposes and then work to achieve them to obtain the highest aim. Be a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ who alone can give life value and meaning, and who also has taken the final judgment upon himself. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we confess that we are not worthy to be thy disciples, but we thank thee that thou hast called us, and that thou hast promised us strength for the tasks thou givest. Forgive us our failures our lack of faith and trust. We pray that we may be worthy followers of Jesus Christ and that we may make him Lord of all our life. In his name we pray. Amen.